Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, mycology, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story and mushroom from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And if you can't tell after the past two episodes, we're still in mushroom month, baby. Hey. I am really excited. I love mushrooms. Like, let's just like, let's put it out there. I love mushrooms. I think they're really cool. I think they're really neat. And while, like, we talked a lot about horror and mushrooms in our previous episode and then the mythology of mushrooms and stuff like that in the episode before that, on this show, I mainly get to talk about things that are, like, mythology and folklore related, right? I mean, yeah, that's that's the that's the name on the tin. Sometimes I just want to talk about mushrooms. <laughs> so that's kind of what this episode is about. I love it. I think it makes all the sense in the world, especially as people are loving Mushroom Month so much, to go ahead and give them more raw material, Julia, more substrate for them to work with so that they can learn about mushrooms and maybe come up with some new mythology, some new urban legends of their own. Maybe, maybe. Maybe you're going to hyper focus on this topic like I have the past couple of years. And now it's like your whole personality and people keep buying you mushrooms as gifts, like, you know, mushroom themed things as gifts. Yeah. Or maybe you're just like, hey, this is interesting stuff. And I'm, I'm glad that I got to hear two of my favorite podcasters talk about it. If that's the case, awesome. I'm so excited. And let's let's get into it. This is really just kind of going to be like fun facts about mushrooms, facts about mushrooms that I find super interesting as well as kind of tying it towards the end to the sort of religious practices around mushrooms. Uh, But I have a lot of fun and exciting history and science about mushrooms to tell you about today. Incredible. I mean, as we all know, mythology and science are not binary opposites. They're intertwined and have been from the very beginning. So I love learning more about the science and facts behind mushrooms as part of uh, understanding their mythological potential. When I was first learning about mushrooms, I was like, what the fuck's a toadstool? (laughs) Sure, yeah. You know, you think about Toad as the character in uh, Super Mario, and you're like, well, how'd they get Toad from that? Oh, Toadstool, that makes sense. But mushrooms are also, like, known as Toadstools, which you've probably heard before. But did you know that calling a mushroom a Toadstool has a more specific meaning? No, I thought it was just a really cute way to refer to the little, we grew up calling them hassocks, but little footstools that, you know, appear in nature, perhaps exactly the right size for a frog. Yes. Well, I like the idea of picturing a little frog sitting on it like, ah, this is my stool. I'm at the Mm -hmm. cute little frog bar and I'm ordering myself a margarita. (laughs) But actually, toadstool in general is used for mushrooms that are specifically poisonous to humans. A helpful And probably if someone, yeah, names like a pet toadstool or kind of asks for it, I believe that's one of the names of the uh, witches familiars in Macbeth. That makes sense. If not uh, close to it, then I, I love that very helpfully. It's ones that you shouldn't eat that are called the toadstools. Yes. And we'll talk a little bit about this later. But like the thing about mushrooms and poisonous mushrooms is there's no like through line to identifying what makes a mushroom poisonous versus what makes it safe to eat. Mm. So having a like fun little like category, like all squares are rhombuses, but not all rhombuses are squares <laughs> thing is really cool. And I love that it has such a cute name. And, you know, if they're not for us to eat, Julie, I know it's one of the principles of foraging that you're probably familiar with um, is, you know, don't take more than you need. And you got to leave enough that the the overall health uh, of the ecosystem and of the the resource that you are foraging, you know, remains strong and resilient. And so I, I love and I'm just charmed by the idea that the mushrooms that you don't harvest to eat and you leave behind you got to leave some for the toadsies. They, their their feetsies need all the little rest. They do. Uh, the rule of thumb in foraging mushrooms is if you find two mushrooms, you take the larger of the two and leave the smaller one so it has more time to grow. And if you are like come across a field of mushrooms, let's say, like a large group of mushrooms, you take 50% and you make sure you leave like a lot of the small ones so that they can continue to grow. That makes sense. That makes sense, right? And that's that's a rule of thumb for most foraging. So like even something like ramps or something like that, you never clear out an entire area of the thing that you're foraging. One of my, I guess, cousins-in-law um, has like a highly protected ramp foraging spot near his house. And every year for two years, he's been like, 
ramp watch, like essentially letting us know exactly when the ramps are ready to go. Haven't made it up yet, but he genuinely won't tell us where it is. He's like, you're going to come to my house. I'm going to drive you somewhere and you're going to close your eyes. I'm going to blindfold you. (laughs) Essentially, yeah. That's wild. I love it, though. But Julia, why the word toadstool? Like, what is that etymology? Well, Amanda, interestingly, it comes from 14th century England, as you can imagine, like the translation is pretty clearly English. Um, And it was literally a reference to stools for toads. That was it. That was it. That was basically it. I love when etymology is just as whimsical as I hope. Exactly. It's the dream. You're just like, oh, yeah. 14th century England, of course, they're just like chilling, having a good time, making up like little... Popping around, smelling like poop. Personifying little toads and how they have little houses. We love to see it. Incredible. (laughs) Well, let's get into a little bit more about like how we know what a mushroom is, what a mushroom is defined as, and kind of also we'll get to an etymology corner as well, Amanda. Don't worry. Always, always. Julia, you come through for me. So for a pretty long time, mushrooms were kind of folded into different kingdoms in taxonomy, uh, but it didn't get its own kingdom of fungi until 1969, when scientist Robert Whitaker separated fungi from animalia and plantae based on how they gain nutrition. Okay. So plants are autotrophs. They basically like, you know, use photosynthesis to make their own food. Animals are, are heterotrophs. We ingest our food. Fungi are saprotrophs. Basically, they process decayed organic matter in order to get their nutrients. Julia, it's a really weird way to say lesbian. (laughs) They're saphotrophs. They feed off of sapphic energy, much like young Amanda torrenting the L word. Mm, That would make sense. Robert Whitaker did not consider that at the time, I don't think. Damn. (laughs) But also, the way that they go about the process of like being a saprotroph and like this is worth mentioning as well because we're going to talk a little bit more about like what they eat and how they eat a little later in this episode but basically what they do is they spread out through their mycelial network which we talked about in previous episodes they dump enzymes outside of that network outside of their body, basically, digest it outside of the body, and then take in the molecules once they've been kind of like decomposed and digested, which is kind of the opposite of what animals do when we ingest our food. Interesting. Like we ingest the food, we digest it in our bodies. They digest it outside of their bodies and then ingest it. That's fascinating. So they're like, they're making the nutrients they need from a world that doesn't have it. It's just not happening in their guts. It's happening around them. Yes, pretty much. But like, it's also not the same process as like a photosynthesizing plant, right? They they have to actively make the nutrients out of something else, something physical. Interesting. And we know that's not only how they eat, but it's also how they spread. So like, as they are eating basically the things that are around them, then the mycelial network spreads into those spaces. So it's really, really cool. That makes sense. So they're not like reproducing and hoping like a seed, right? Like when a tree, you know, drops uh, seeds or pollen, um, it's it's spreading, hoping and knowing that most of it won't find somewhere hospitable, but some of it will. But yes. instead, the, the mushrooms almost have like an advance guard, you know, that are like making a hospitable landing place. And then, I mean, I guess like colonizing, right? Or like spreading into the land that they have then made hospitable for them. Yes, I think that's that's pretty accurate. Um, there is also a we'll talk about spores and like what the mushroom is compared to the mycelial network after this. But you're you're on the money there for sure. Cool. We also know that uh, fun fact, Amanda, fungi are more closely related to animals than they are to plants. Really. Yeah, so like animals, they take in oxygen and release CO2. Uh, Their cell walls actually contain chitin, which you might recognize as the thing that makes up like exoskeletons of stuff like insects or crustaceans or even like the beaks of octopi, which is really, really interesting. So at some point, human beings, all animals and fungi had a shared ancestor, which I think is amazing. That's really fascinating. And isn't chitin what your fingernails are made up of, too? Or is that something different? I think that's something different. So the thing is, taxonomy in general is sometimes really broad and really weird. Like, you've probably heard the fact that, like, there's no such thing as a fish, quote unquote. Oh, is that what 
what that's from. Yeah, so nice. it's this idea from this biologist named Stephen Jay Gould, who said that there are so many sea creatures, but most of them are not closely related to each other. So, for example, a salmon is more closely related to a camel than it is a hagfish. That's really interesting and also seems like a little bit arbitrary. Like, again, like, how are we counting it? And it just the the like realm of, of biological difference is mm-hmm. so like we're talking in such minute amounts. Like, you know, when you look at a timeline of human history, like evolutionarily, we're living mm-hmm. in like the last 10 minutes of the day, you know, or that kind of uh, uh, time scale. That's how it feels when we talk about like the difference uh, of DNA of organisms, uh, where it's like there is there is so much of that code that just goes into, you know, making cells and making those cells regenerate that when we talk about like the tiny differences that separate, you know, human beings from, uh, you know, other species, much less one another, or even things like a fish or a mushroom, uh, it just it, it feels like we're we're painting with such like a small realm of the visible spectrum that it makes me want to learn more about like microbiology because you know mm-hmm. viruses and microbes and like all of these different uh organisms are just like the the possibilities are like even bigger than i think my little brain can wrap around yeah and you know it's complicated for scientists who study these things too and they're constantly disagreeing All this to say, taxonomy is super messy in general, and even in the kingdom of fungi, that is true. So fungi applies not only to things like mushrooms and toadstools, but to the microorganisms like yeasts and mold as well, which means that we have an estimated 5.1 million species of fungi, which is many, many, many times over what the amount of known plant species on the planet is. Yeah, that checks out. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that very so cool? cool. All, also, all the delicious things. All the delicious things. Give me some things. fermented. Give me some aged. Give me some cave ripened. This is the this is the kingdom I want to eat from. You oh, know? Yeah. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll get there. But uh, let's let's head over to our little etymology corner, shall we? Hooray! So we get fungus directly from the Latin word fungus, which means mushroom in Latin. Nice. The Romans took their Latin word from the Greek word sphungos, which means sponge, which is a reference to kind of the spongy qualities that mushroom bodies as well as molds had. Any uh, relation, Julia, to the sea sponge, or is that just a sort of quirk of nature? I believe that's a different type of thing altogether. It's a different like uh, animal species. Listen, early in COVID, Eric and I watched a lot of videos of jellyfish and like uh, jellyfish uh, segments from my second favorite show, The Aquarium, after my first favorite show, The Zoo. And we learned that jellyfish are not fish. Uh, they are they are called jellies. And so every time I hear uh, people talk about jellyfish, I'm like, the, the real name is even more charming and it's jellies. <laughs> no, I love it. It's so cute. You're like, oh, yes, the little jellies. Yeah. And I, I was double checking to make sure uh, sea sponges are, in fact, animals. Hey! (laughs) Not plants, animals. Whole different thing. So when we talk about something like mycology, which is the study of mushrooms, that comes from the Greek word mykes, which translates to mushroom as opposed to sponge, which we just mentioned before. Uh, And I've seen some references online to a dryad named Mycenae or Mycenae, who is supposed to be kind of like the the dryad of mushrooms, like the, the spiritual embodiment of mushrooms. But I can't find any like scholarly sources about that, just kind of passing references on the internet. So I'm not sure how true that is exactly. That feels like an internet fever dream, for sure. It does. It does feel like an internet fever dream, for sure. So we know that human beings have been using mushrooms in some form or another since prehistory. One of the earliest references to human beings using mushrooms that we have is from Atzi the Iceman. Have you heard of Atzi before? Isn't he like a, a preserved body that gives us some like scientific insight into early humanity? Yes, he is a 5,300-year-old Neolithic mummy that was found in the Austrian Alps. Uh, and on his body, they found two polypore mushrooms, which scientists believe were either used as tinder or for medicinal purposes. All right, Julia, um, that's incredible. But I do want to just ask if your body were preserved with like the thing you would bring on a mountain trek, like on a long walk or on a hike, what would future scientists have to assume about 
you know, humanity at the time of you. Because for me, there's going to be a lot of chapstick. Interesting. They're going to be like, wow, chapstick must be so important to these people. Uh, I carry a variety of like phone chargers and adapters because the shit mm-hmm. protocol keeps changing. So they're like, wow, uh, you know, I don't know, must be just like prepared for anything. Maybe she traded these. There's so many of them. Yeah, mine would be a, a small like pocket sized book on mushrooms because Jake got yep. that for me when I got really into my mushroom hunting and like a small bag of almonds like one of those like tall nice. bags you know what i mean oh mm-hmm. yeah 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 they're like oh so classic yeah mine is probably uh chewy granola mm. bar where <laughs> they're like oh yeah mm-hmm. important mm. food sacred food the sacred food the chocolate yes <laughs> so we know that human beings were at least utilizing mushrooms in some form or another for at least 5300 years mushrooms have since then been used across the globe in traditional and folk medicines as well. Uh, Greek physician Hippocrates of the Hippocratic Oath wrote about mushrooms having anti-inflammatory properties and how they could be used to cauterize wounds. Hmm. Indigenous North American people used puffball mushrooms in wound care. Chinese traditional medicine utilizes many different types of medicinal mushrooms, including the lingji, which we talked about in our Mushrooms in Mythology episode. Mm-hmm. And it's also worth noting that we get penicillin from mushrooms, Amanda. Hey, thanks, guys. There are so many ongoing studies as well to see if mushrooms can be used to develop various different treatments, including antibiotics, immunosuppressants, even anti-cancer drugs. Like, we're constantly trying to figure out what it is about mushrooms that can make us feel better and feel healthier, as well as trying to figure out, like, hey... What's up with these? (laughs) I feel like we've also just scratched the surface uh, barely on like looking at plants and animals for all kinds of treatments from insulin to, you know, all kinds of like antiseptics. And so it makes sense that the by far the vast majority of like biodiversity on Earth would have some secrets to share that we haven't found yet. Amanda, I'm so glad you mentioned insulin because we're going to talk a little bit about pigs. Hey, let's do it. Those truffle-sniffing little friends. Yes, so obviously we know that human beings have been cultivating or eating mushrooms for a very long time. We train animals like pigs and dogs to find rare mushrooms. And I know you know a lot about truffles, Amanda, because you read that incredible truffle underground book, right? That's right. So, Amanda, do you know why we specifically use pigs to find truffles? Uh, It feels like a thing I knew at some point but don't now, so please tell me. Well, So we can train dogs to basically find anything. Dogs love finding things. It's like in their (laughs) DNA. Pigs are trained to truffle hunt because truffles smell like pig pheromones. Oh, yes. Good. They they want to track down that sexy, sexy other pig that is somewhere underneath the ground. And then they find mushrooms and they're like, fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it. Uh, I saw a tweet this morning, Julia, that was like, AI can't make art because AI can't be horny, which is the first step to so many kinds of good art. That is true. And A, made me laugh. B, uh, fuck AI. I want AI to work so I can make art, not the other way around. Yes. Uh, and, And C, that just makes me laugh so much that this quirk of nature means that the the scent profile of truffle mushrooms, a thing that humans have decided is super tasty and mm-hmm. therefore valuable, uh, is similar to, you know, a pig being like, mm. mm-hmm. I want a piece of that. I want a little action there, a little pig action. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, can I blow your mind? Please. Picture your kind of like average neighborhood grocery store, right? Okay. You go to the produce section and you see mushrooms there. Yeah. What kind of mushrooms are you seeing there? Probably like a white button mushroom, mm-hmm. maybe a portobello. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the two that come to mind the most. Maybe like a hen of the woods. That's like a very common bougie mushroom. Fancy bougie mushroom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we're talking like, so the ones that you would tr- you listed two of the three that I was thinking of. Cool. Button mushrooms, portobello mushrooms, cremini mushrooms. Yes. Amanda, I'm going to blow your mind. They're all the same species. <laughs> no, really? The only difference is their age and color, but they are all versions of Agaricus bisporus. Really? They look so... I mean, I guess button mushrooms I could see growing into the portobello. They have a similar shape, but creminis look so different. So creminis are basically just like baby button mushrooms. Yeah. White button mushrooms are just an albino strain of that same species of mushroom. And then portobellos are the fully mature version of those mushrooms. Fascinating. It's all lies. It's all lies. (laughs) I mean, I I guess in theory, like, 
you know, all apples are the same species. There's different like varieties, you know, and like cultivars of the same thing. Mm. But for some reason, yeah, just the that really struck me as like shocking. I had no idea. Well, that's like, um, this is not a plug for Head, Heart, Gut, the friendly debate show where there's no right answer, just the best answer. But Misha blew my mind when we were doing our best vegetable argument by saying that like brassica, like, you know, you think of brassicas, you think of like broccoli and stuff like that. But then they kept listing... Cabbage, Brussels sprouts. Amanda, they're all the same species of plant just grown differently. <laughs> that's how the broccoli family owners of the James Bond IP got their money. <laughs> I don't. Is that true? I don't know if that's true, but I like I want it to be. I won't look it up, Julia, because I don't want to be disappointed if it's wrong. <laughs> don't. It is true that the James Bond IP is owned yes, by the broccoli. I knew family. that. I did know that. Yes. But that's like wild to me that like, I guess the broccolis of broccoli fame and also James Bond. Wild. I'm pretty sure because they worked with the DiCecco. There's DiCecco broccoli is like a, a very common variety. They're tied so. to the mob. That's all I know. That's all we know. That's all we know. All right. So not only were human beings mushroom hunting, cultivating mushrooms, but like you kind of mentioned earlier, we use fungi in a lot of different foods as well. Uh, mold fungi is used in a lot of soybean products, for example, miso and soy sauce and tempeh. And of course, this is most important to me, we wouldn't have cheese if it wasn't for cultivated molds. So like you think of a nice brie or a nice camembert, the white fuzzy stuff on the outside of that, that's mold, baby delicious mold the blue that makes blue cheese blue cheese that is penicillium rocaforte which Ooh. is the scientific name and it got its scientific name from the fact that it is most frequently used in blue cheese roquefort amazing and not only are we using it for our foods and stuff like that we also use it for stuff like dyeing clothes you know like there are a bunch of mushrooms that can be used by combining them with either like ammonia or another kind of like color extracting solvent which kind of pulls the color out of the mushrooms and then by using stuff like turkey tails dyers polypore bluets even stuff like chicken of the woods like you mentioned you can get colors anywhere from red to yellow to green and even purples and blues when combined with other things extremely metal it's so cool so basically that was what we were using before we had synthetic dyes we often would rely on mushrooms for strong and vivid colors and textiles so cool now amanda i think you know this fact because i did re reveal it to you recently off this camera off this microphone but did you know that there are in fact carnivorous types of mushrooms you know i didn't and then i did and then my brain kind of calloused over it like a splinter um mm -hmm. and so now i am re-reckoning with the fact that there are carnivorous mushrooms yes in the 1980s, scientists discovered that oyster mushrooms, which is a fairly common mushroom in the culinary world, you can probably find it at your local bougie or supermarket, like a Whole Foods or something like that. They found out that they are, in fact, carnivores. Mm. So here's the thing. Oyster mushrooms typically grow on damp logs, but mushrooms also need a lot of nitrogen in their diet in order to thrive and survive, right? So in order to get that essential nitrogen... Oyster mushrooms feed on nematodes, which are a kind of very small worm. They're like basically microscopic. I mean, still, a nematode has a shape. It has internal organs. <laughs> the idea of a mushroom consuming a thing with a shape uh, makes me a little bit feel like I'm in a horror movie. Yes, uh, it is a little scary. But here's here's how they go about it. It's pretty cool. They wait until the nematodes crawl onto their body, like the, the mushroom, the spore itself. Mm -hmm. And then they release a toxin that then paralyzes the nematodes. And then all mushrooms have this type of like tendril. It's like the, the tendril, like the fingers of the mycelial network called the hyphae. Mm. And the hyphae basically reach into the nematodes disrupt their cell membrane which causes them to rapidly dissolve so that the oyster mushroom can then devour them and get that sweet sweet nitrogen that the oyster mushroom craves that is some cthulhuian maw <laughs> injecting poison into a, yeah. a body and then dissolving it from the mm -hmm. inside holy shit Mm -hmm. It's very scary. Very scary. <laughs> I was reading the article and they were interviewing like someone who, one of the scientists who helped discover this. And they're like, it's very dramatic. And I'm like, that's <laughs> one way for it. That's a word for it, my guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no lies detected. 
There are other types of fungi out there that catch and kill nematodes in various other ways. Uh, sometimes they use pheromones to lure the nematodes to them. Other times they release like these tiny sickle-shaped spores that take over the body of the nematode and kill them from within. The uh-huh. reason we don't get as hyped up about these is because they, they're not edible. We can't buy them in the store. So we're very hype on oyster mushrooms being a thing that can can eat other things. Yeah. And it really it really makes the oysters of the sea seem like real saints. Because yes. all the oysters do is they they sift out pollution and make a and make a tasty little tongue for me to to slurp down. It's true. It's true. Oh, Amanda, I have so many more mushroom facts that I want to tell you about and maybe like answer some of your burning questions about mushrooms. Yes. But first, I think we got to take a quick refill. Let's do it. Hello, hello, everybody. Amanda here and welcome to The Mid-Roll. Thank you so very much for listening to this episode, for supporting us, for hanging with us through Mushroom Month. It's been really fun to try new stuff and learn more about one of Julia's very favorite things. And thanks as well to new patron Scott Sheldon, who upgraded to a $40 annual patron. Thank you so much, Scott. It is so helpful for us when you are annual patrons because it helps us understand how much support we're going to get throughout the year. And also for you, it gives you a discount on a whole year of support. Thank you to our supporting producer-level patrons, Alicia, Anne, Ariana, Ashley, Ginger Spurs Boy, Hannah, Jack Marie, Jane, Jeremiah, Nieselkins, Lily, Matthew, Captain Jonathan, Malachi, Cosmos, Sarah, and Scott Sheldon. And thank you to our legend-level patrons, Audra, Bex, Chibi Yokai, Michael, Morgan H, Sarah, and BME Up Scotty. You can join these lovely folks, get access to hundreds of bonus posts, recipe cards, director's commentary behind every episode, and so much more. We just posted a brand new advice video and audio podcast from Julia and me answering your advice questions at patreon.com slash spirits podcast. This week, I would highly recommend that you go ahead and get a plant. Now, you guys know I love plants. That is uh, no surprise to anyone here. But I recently got some strawberry plants that were on sale, just like little sprouts uh, from my local like corner flower shop uh, for just three bucks for a little set of like three strawberry plants, which was incredible. And so I uh, put them in some, you know, extra soil I had lying around and I put them in a little pot and I put them on my windowsill and they just make me so happy to look at. And listen, maybe the birds will get it, maybe the squirrels will get it, but I know that it brings me so much joy to see them and their beautiful little leaves and their flowers poking up every day. So if you've never been a plant person and you're like, hey, it's it's nice where I live, or everybody in the Southern Hemisphere, it's getting to be the season where I want to be inside and be cozy. Maybe I want a little, a little green friend with me. Think about it. And then tag me at She's So Mickey. This week, there has been uh, so much great stuff happening over on Big Game Hunger. Jenna recently had a member of the Double Clicks, a band that was a huge deal when I was coming up on the internet, uh, Laser Weber, on to Big Game Hunger, uh, her weekly comedy show where Jenna and friends craft the next big video game every episode. They start with a randomly generated genre, concept, and vibe, and then improvise and talk and work their way through an IP so resistible that you'll be ready to, like, risk 20 bucks for it on Steam. It's so fun. It's so good. It's a wonderful thing to put on in the car to listen to uh, with you and your friends or when going on a walk or whatever else you're going to be doing. So go ahead and check out Big Game Hunger, new episodes every Monday. We are sponsored this week by Shaker and Spoon, a subscription cocktail service that helps you learn how to make handcrafted cocktails right at home. Uh, It was recently the birthday of my grandfather, who passed away a few years ago, uh, helped raise me, take me to school every day, and his favorite drink was gin and tonic. And so I decided to make myself a little, like, zhuzhed up gin and tonic in his memory uh, and to enjoy it and think about him and share some photos and memories of him with my siblings. And I remember from many years ago getting a gin box with Shaker and Spoon that taught me about some wonderful techniques about how to use gin beyond the gin and tonic. have tonic at home. So I was like, what am I going to do? And made a beautiful gin cocktail from the gorgeous recipe cards that Shaker and Spoon send and that I save. So I have a lovely little stack of recipe cards that I can pull from going forward. That's the whole point of Shaker and Spoon. It's not just, oh, here's enough stuff to make three really cool different cocktails every month. It's also teaching you skills and upping your home mixology knowledge. They're so great. They're a lovely team. We love to work with them. Our longest lasting sponsor, I believe. So 
go ahead, go to shakerandspoon.com slash creepy to get $20 off your first box. That's shakerandspoon.com slash creepy. And finally, we are sponsored by Soul, who make absolutely wonderful CBD gummies. I am very sensitive to temperature while I'm sleeping, and recently my air conditioners have been uh, on the fritz at home. Uh, not great when it's above 90 degrees here at um, uh, in New York City. So uh, I really appreciate that CBD gummies help me fall asleep faster and sleep through the night. I used to be a very nervous sleeper. I would honestly like not want to go on trips with friends because I was like, what if I can't fall asleep? Like, what am I going to do? And honestly, CBD has been really, really helpful for doing that. And I love that gummies are so easy to take. You can pack a couple of them on a trip. You can bring them um, on, you know, just in your regular bathroom in your uh, regular life. But I highly recommend their out-of-office gummies by Soul. They are perfectly microdosed by hemp-derived THC and CBD to give any day or evening like a chillin' on the beach kind of relaxing vibe. These days, you can get hemp-derived THC products delivered to all 50 states in the U.S., so you can go ahead and access them nationwide. I love them. I take one almost every night. They are really good, delicious, and they really help people like me deal with things like anxiety, sleeplessness, focus, pain. So give Soul a try. Head to GetSoul.com and use code SPIRITS for 30% off your order. That's 30% off your order using code SPIRITS. One last time, GetSoul.com, code SPIRITS for 30% off. And now let's get back to the show. Amanda, we took our break, and I know you have some dying questions for me. Some urgent, urgent questions, Julia. There's only there's only one more week in the month. I know. I have I have answers to I believe your urgent, urgent mushroom questions. So why don't you hit me with your first one? All right, we touched on it a little bit with toadstools, but I'm curious what exactly makes some mushrooms poisonous to humans and some not. I think of it kind of like this. Um, similarly to why some plants are poisonous to humans and others aren't, some mushrooms are poisonous in order to like protect themselves from being eaten so that they can more easily reproduce. Like much like plants, however, some adapt to be edible in order to encourage being eaten to spread spores that way. Yeah, uh, there are like there are actually types of mushrooms that will coat their spores so that they can survive the digestive processes of animals. It's very cool. Right on. But mushrooms are different from most plants because they tend not to last as long in mushroom form. So when we talk about mushrooms versus the mycelial network, mushroom is the the fruiting body of the mycelial network, right? Mm -hmm. Much like, you know, plants have fruits that or like berries or stuff like that that grow. And those are their kind of like reproductive organs. That is what the mushroom, the thing that you see grow out of the ground or out of a tree or something like that is for the mycelial network. So I may regret asking this, but then how do they release spores and what are spores exactly? So spores are just kind of like baby mushrooms. Mm -hmm. They grow typically like gilled mushrooms are typically the ones that spore as opposed to others which don't necessarily spore and just tend to spread out in other various ways. But they kind of grow on the gills of the mushroom and then they are released through various different methods. Typically they'll like wait for wind in order to kind of like spread that way. Fun fact though, Amanda, the total kind of aside for what we're talking about in toxicity. Some species of mushrooms, because they spread via their spores, a lot of times they need that wind. But did you know that sometimes they don't wait for the wind, but rather they can make their own wind? What? So basically, research has suggested that by releasing water vapor out of their bodies, for lack of a better phrase, the yeah. cooling of the vapor in the air can create these very small localized air streams that help spread the spores away from the fruiting mushroom. That's nuts, because I mean, especially in what I would imagine of like a, a dank environment, low to the ground, maybe partially covered, like mm -hmm. you're not going to get a ton of wind the way you are at the top of like the canopy of a forest. True. That's so cool. OK, so going back to the toxicity of mushrooms a little bit, because they don't last very long, they need to be able to spread their spores quickly, which means they can't risk being eaten. Sure. 
hence the toxicity. And there are really only a small number of species of mushrooms that are like truly deadly to humans, but many are toxic to some extent. And there are like 11 identified uh, mycotoxins that have been that can be produced by a mushroom with varying degrees of toxicity. So there are some that can be made safe by cooking them sometimes. Like, for example, you can like saute something, a mushroom to make it more palatable for the human body. You can double boil them, you can dry them, et cetera, et cetera. But there are a lot of other mushrooms, like deadly mushrooms, like the the fly agaric that we've talked about before, that like they're thermostable. So it takes a lot, a lot, a lot in order to make it sort of consumable. And even then you're risking like severe liver damage by by trying to consume it. Yeah. So maybe don't. Maybe don't. That is the problem. Like I mentioned earlier, there is no single trait that all toxic mushrooms have, which makes identifying mushrooms a little bit difficult. So if you aren't extremely positive about the identity of a mushroom you find in the wild, don't eat it. Just yeah. don't eat it. It's good rule. Good rule. So that explains why are some poisonous, why are some not? Right on. And I know we got to this a little bit with the uh, the mycelial network and with the spores, but I guess in my mind, like people refer to like a colony of mushrooms or like a group of mushrooms as like one being, whereas mm-hmm. we don't refer to something like a field of flowers or like a, you know, rock covered in moss in that same way. So like how do scientists refer to a like I know the mushroom itself is not an organism. It's like the fruit of the organism. So tell me a little mm-hmm. bit more about like how they're organized and how we refer to them. Yeah. So we, we've we talked about the mycelium a little bit. That's that root-like structure that really makes up the fungus. And the mushrooms that we see pop out of the ground are just the fruit that allow the spores to spread more. But we often do talk about how huge fungal networks are, mainly because that like sounds really cool and is a cool biological example. Like, yeah. for example, the, the honey fungi, which is an extremely long-lived and like the largest living fungi in the world. There's one mycelial network that covers 3.4 miles of Oregon's Malheur National Forest and is also bioluminescent. Oh my God. But in reality, like most of the mycelia that you'll find in nature are quite small. They're too small for us even to see without the assistance of a microscope. They also, unlike stuff like moss and flowers and stuff like that, they don't require light to grow because they don't do photosynthesis, but rather they get those nutrients from the ground around them when they help things to decompose. Right on. The largest living thing in the entire world is, in fact, a mushroom, a mycelial network. That's amazing. And makes mm-hmm. sense, too, why, like, you can probably, individual parts of it can be damaged, but the you know, network as a whole is fine because unlike old school Christmas lights, <laughs> disrupting one little portion of it is not going to throw off the entire network. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Julia, I think in my mind, I assume that mushrooms and the kingdom fungi are some of the oldest sort of organisms that we have on Earth. Is that true? Yes, they are extremely old. And in fact, we found out fairly recently that they're actually older than we thought that they were. Right on. So in 2020, a scientist from the Université Libre de Brussels announced that mushrooms evolved somewhere between 715 to 810 million years ago, which is actually 300 million years earlier than we originally believed. That's like star math. That's like the age of stars. (laughs) Holy shit. Part of the reason that we don't have a ton of information on the history of mushrooms and fungi as a as a whole is because they're pretty fragile all things considered which makes mushroom fossils extremely rare and difficult to find but they did find these fossilized mycelium in the democratic republic of congo giving scientists kind of a glimpse into the importance of mushrooms on the early earth and they've kind of discovered that early fungi were usually found in coastal regions and Mm. kind of were very involved in a sort of symbiotic relationship to early plants. And they were like very important partners to one another in the kind of developing world of the earth as it was 
an early planet. Yeah, I mean, I remember, be, you know, being very moved by, you know, in, in geology, studying how, you know, mosses kind of start breaking down. There's some of those, like, quote, pioneer species is how we learned about it back then. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. a, a different terms in use now. Uh, breaking rock into soil and kind of beginning that process where there is a more, like, organic, uh, you know, mulchy, loamy material that plants as we know it can start to thrive in. Yeah, and mushrooms and fungi in general are very important to that like process of like life itself. Like I was I was listening to a episode of Ologies for the mycologist episode of Ologies and he stated pretty succinctly he's like if fungi did not exist um we would have a lot more like the world would be covered in much more wood and much more shit. Right on. So extremely important to the process of what the world is as we know it, like nature as a whole. Mushrooms, very cool. Much cooler than I thought at the start of this month. Yay. So uh, let's move on. And uh, Amanda, obviously on this podcast, we, we talk a lot about human culture. We care a lot about human culture, how humanity kind of interacts with the natural world, et cetera, et cetera. And when it comes to culture's relationship with fungi, that is a science that is called ethnomycology. Hell yes. What a good term. If I met an ethnomycologist at a party, I'd be like, we're, we're going to a different room because you and I are going to talk <laughs> all night. You're also probably going to a different room because they would love for you to take some psychoactive mushrooms <laughs> in general. So but I'm getting ahead of myself. So okay. ethnomycology is the sociological impact that fungi have on humanity. There's a lot of focus on the topic of mushrooms as medicine, mushrooms as food, mushrooms as fuel, etc. But starting in the 1950s, it became focused particularly on the study of psychoactive mushrooms and their role in human history. Sure. And that's because it's it's a fairly extensive thing to talk about. And I want to break down a little of like what is happening to your brain and body when you take a psychoactive mushroom, because we're going to be talking a little bit about that more in this back half of the episode. But when we're talking about the like, quote unquote, magic mushrooms, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, as we understand it in specifically Western culture, typically we are talking about mushrooms that produce psilocybin. Mm -hmm. Something that people may have heard of before. There are certain areas in the United States where it is legalized, et cetera, et cetera. And I know something that I've read a lot about uh, psilocybin being used in like mental health and mental illness research um, as, you know, potential like treatment resistant mental illnesses. Yes. uh, Specifically, it is being researched right now in order to treat things like PTSD, OCD, cluster headaches, depression, and especially is really being interestingly researched for end of life mental health care, Mm. which I think is is very fascinating. Like you can look up Johns Hopkins, I think, is doing a lot of research on uh, the usage of psilocybin in those kind of uh, care situations. Wow. So talking about psilocybin, psilocybin in your body converts to something that is called psilocin, which has a very similar structure to another important part of our brain chemistry, which is serotonin. Sure. The good one. Yes, the good one. (laughs) So the psilocin will bind to the serotonin receptor sites in your brain, which is basically what causes the trip, because basically it's like the chemicals we already produce in our brains, just in much higher quantities. Uh, Not too dissimilar, it seems, from my antidepressant, in my case, an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, uh, figuring out and sort of regulating how much serotonin my brain eats and how much it, it leaves. Exactly, exactly. So you can see why people are doing research into, hey, how can this help people who maybe are not producing the right amount of serotonin? Or how can it help people like... You know, it, it basically it creates different like connections in neurons in your brains by attaching to those receptors in your brain. Fascinating. This is also, I want to stress to you, a distinctly different experience than the trip you would have if you consumed, let's say, fly agaric. Mm. It's a different type of like neurotoxin situation that is happening inside your brain. Got it. But Psilocybin is produced in over 200 different species of mushrooms, which is a lot, and are mostly found in temperate climates, both in Europe and the Americas, though there are some species that are found in Asia, Africa, and Australia, just to a lesser extent. Nice. 
magic mushrooms, they became very popularized in Western culture in the 50s. But why? I don't know. Amanda, this is wild. And you just strap in and stick with me. <laughs> OK, because I'm just going to tell you right now, uh, I've heard some things about, you know, CIA research. I've, uh, I've heard some things about, you know, uh, hippies enjoying trips. I, I got nothing. So it all kind of starts in the 1950s in Western culture with this guy. His name is Robert Gordon Wasson. Okay. He was an author. He was, I would guess, an amateur ethnomycologist. That isn't quite a thing yet in, in society and culture. A guy who likes mushrooms. Yeah, he, he loves mushrooms. And wildly, Amanda, his other claim to fame was he was the VP for public relations for J.P. Morgan. <laughs> Oh, sure. My former employer. Uh, you know, Julia, surprisingly, they don't cover that in the history of J.P. Morgan you Weird. get when you join the company. Yeah. yeah Interesting. Yeah. No. So Wasson becomes interested in mushrooms because he is on his honeymoon with his wife in the Catskill Mountains in 1927. Loves finding out about mushrooms, learns about foraging, stuff like that. His wife, who is a Russian pediatrician, is also very, like, remembers her childhood and, like, the the mushrooms of her, your, you know? Mm -hmm. This is 1927. We fast forward to the 1950s. The man is still very interested in mushrooms while he's working at J.P. Morgan and, and whatnot. <laughs> he is particularly interested in the different view of mushrooms in the United States compared to those in Russia, again, because of his, his Russian wife, specifically okay. the Amanita muscaria, which is the red and white mushroom everyone knows, the fly agaric. Mm. Everyone knows it's poisonous, but also psychoactive. So he writes a book that becomes very popular. But moreover, he starts traveling and doing a lot of research into psychoactive mushrooms. Now, Amanda, you're probably wondering, you're like, this guy is the VP of PR for J.P. Morgan. What is he doing traveling the world researching mushrooms in 1956? Julia is spending his finance salary on his crazy hobby, which all finance dudes do. Well, Amanda, he didn't have to spend his finance salary because he was funded by the CIA. <laughs> OK, all right. There we go. You know, again, some CIA things you're like, that's a conspiracy theory. And then some of them are like they they did assassinate this radical leader. Yes. Right. OK, so he claimed he didn't know that the CIA was funding him. Documents that were surfaced by the Freedom of Information Act also claim that he was a, quote, unwitting participant. OK. But they sponsored his research as part of MK Ultra of all things. No. Basically, they were hoping that his research on psychoactive mushrooms would help them learn basically how to brainwash and mind control people. Yeah, that sounds like a thing the American government would put money behind. I mean, I, I'm sure I could read about this, but I'm I'm just imagining that he's like, hey, honey, someone sent me a check in the mail for fifteen thousand dollars for the mushrooms. Like, isn't that nice? Well, it's it's wild. He gets his money from the CIA, which he accepted under the cover name of the Geshticker Fund for Medical Research. Oh, sure. Sure. So around this time, Life magazine publishes an article about his research called Seeking the Magic Mushroom which outlines how he and his wife became the first Westerners to participate in a Mazatec, which is a one of the indigenous people of Mexico's mushroom ritual. Mm. He is a shithead about this, which is unsurprising because he's a white man working for J.P. Morgan and is trying to do a religious ritual from a people he is not from. But he lies to the curandera who does the ritual for him because typically... This is a ritual that is done to help locate missing people. And so he lies to her and claims that his son is missing. He's worried about him. That's why he wants to do the ritual. That's a very bad lie, especially in a religious ceremony context. Holy shit. And this guy fucking ruins his poor Corandera's life. He becomes incredibly famous. He profits from it greatly. He never faces any fucking consequences. He is an <sighs> asshole. He's just the worst yeah, it feels like a story that Life magazine and, you know, uh, wealthy Americans in the 50s would really eat up. Yes. But this is also what popularizes the idea of the recreational use of psilocybin mushrooms. For better or for worse, this is where it comes from. Which it sounds like, again, it wasn't for recreation to begin with, based on the context of what the current era thought they were doing. Yes, exactly. It wasn't. It was a religious ceremony. And so this guy kind of just... <sighs> He just kind of ruined it all, you know? Mm -hmm. He really just took something that was sacred and kind of, like, made it into a thing that, 
like hippies will casually do now. Yeah. It's rough. But the use of psychoactive mushrooms in human culture is fairly widespread, was fairly widespread. And there are many theories that they were used in various religious rituals globally, though these mm. theories, again, kind of definitely vary in credibility. Like we mentioned in the first episode, that Santa mushroom theory, again, things kind of are uh, debatable, you know? Um, we, we've mentioned the Eleusinian mysteries in ancient Greece here on the podcast before, and there are some ethnomycologists who believe that the sacrament of the Kaikion from the Eleusinian mysteries was some sort of psychoactive mushroom. Uh, and like ethnomycologists are in general kind of like an interesting bunch. You don't say. A lot of them don't have a lot of like fo either formal training and education or they're otherwise like considered outliers in their yeah. academic field. Like, for example, Terence McKenna was someone who found a lot of notoriety in his claim that the ingestion of psilocybin was how human language was first formed and that psychedelic mushrooms may have acted as the original quote unquote tree of knowledge. I mean, listen, I don't want to dismiss it all the way, but I, I see how somebody publishing a paper on, like, anything psychoactive uh, or anything rooted in folk medicine, like, would have a, a layer of, like, you know, unbelievability to kind of push through before you can get to reviewing it on its merits. Right. And it, you know, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. That theory is called the stoned ape theory, which it, like makes it seem a lot sillier than it probably really is. Yes, it does sound like an NFT. Yes. And and unfortunately, he, he passed away pretty tragically in the year 2000. But this was also the same man who kind of popularized the idea of the 2012 Mayan calendar end of the world thing. Oh, sure. That people got really hyped up about like about a decade or so ago. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's like we kind of had to take some things with a grain of salt, you know? You know, like like most stuff in life and like most mushrooms. Some you eat, some you don't. Exactly. Amanda, because we have such a Western bias, we think of psychoactive mushroom usage in general as a thing that was like really became popularized in the 1950s and 60s. But obviously there is a history of humans altering their consciousness, like we've been talking about a lot in the past couple episodes. Yeah, seeking communion with the universe. Yes, exactly. And that can be done in, in various different ways, as, as you point out very uh, eloquently often. But we've been basically trying to alter our consciousness since we have been humans. And psychoactives are a huge part of that. Like we know that in Mesoamerica, they were being used thousands of years before the colonization by Columbus, as well as the Spaniards. And we even have records of the Spaniards banning the use of sacred mushrooms, which were referred to by the indigenous people as the flesh of the gods. I'm sure the Spaniards wanted none of that. Yep, that checks out. Yeah, they tried very hard to kind of eliminate all reference to it. Really, the only reason that we have a written record of it kind of right now, because the Spaniards did such a terrible, terrible thing to the indigenous people of Central America, is because there was like one monk who really wanted to write about it Ooh. and managed to keep the like writings that he did on record and not like destroyed by the church. Incredible. Julia, I now have the very unique life experience of one of my very closest friends is about to become a nun um, and in, in the midst of nun training and just learning about the, the absolute uh, incredible work that many uh, monks and nuns as like people allowed to think for a living and write and record for a living uh, under the crushing weight of uh, first feudalism and then capitalism uh, really you know, underappreciated, um, I think, by me uh, up until, you know, last year. If only we were allowed to do that in society not tied to religion, you know? I know, Julia. Think of the number of, I mean, I, you and I both follow like so many, you know, uh, histories they didn't allow you to learn in school, Instagrams and like community oriented zine archives and like oral storytelling and oral history projects. Uh, how nice would it be if you did not have to uh, dedicate your life to live off of the uh, tithing of the rich and could just do that? And this is why we are pro universal basic income here on the podcast. Yeah, I'm going full socialism. I'm pro full socialism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
I think UBI is a good bridge mechanism. I, I agree. I agree. So similarly, the ancient Egyptians believed that mushrooms were the food of the gods and believed that eating them could help prolong their lives, which is not entirely inaccurate. Mushrooms are very good for you in general. Love it. Uh, there is similarly a theory that the Viking berserkers, you, do you know the Viking berserkers, Amanda? Yes. Uh, they might have also utilized psychoactive mushrooms to get into their kind of like frenzied state before battle. Mm -hmm. Originally, scientists and scholars thought that maybe they were eating the quintessential fly agaric mushroom. But as we've talked about before, processing fly agaric mushrooms is difficult and can also can lead to severe illness and death if they're consumed in a larger quantity. But nowadays, scholars who subscribe to this theory believe that it wasn't fly agaric, but it was in fact the liberty cap, which is a psilocybin mushroom that can be found in the grasslands of Europe, usually in pastures fertilized by livestock dung. Okay. There's also a really interesting theory that I believe came out of Ohio State University that the reason that psilocybin mushrooms often grow either in dung or in land that was fertilized by dung and why they are so psychoactive is because it was a deterrent so that the bugs that would normally be around, mm -hmm. you know, feces and stuff like that would then trip mad balls and would then not want to eat the mushrooms anymore. Uh, Julia, are you sure it's because uh, it's not because of the ancient axiom, the closer to the cow pie, the closer to God? <laughs> no, I don't think that that's accurate. It's that's not that's not the case. Well, how does that translate to Latin? <laughs> it, it rhymes in Latin, actually. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> Uh, I will also say that there are sources that say that Vikings would enrich their mead with fly agaric, but I also don't know what the process of safely extracting it to make it consumable would be like. I googled that. There were several people on YouTube that claimed that they did it and did it safely, but I don't know. That's a very high stakes uh, tutorial to follow. Uh, but maybe some of those scientists that brewed beer from that ancient strain of yeast uh, that they recovered that I think it was from ancient Egypt mm -hmm. or Mesopotamia, maybe they could get a go of this in a safe way. Maybe they could. I don't know. Who can say? But there are definitely other examples out there of psychoactive mushroom usage that dates back to like over a millennia. But I'm also kind of hesitant to talk about that as related to religious practices because a lot of the research is, for lack of a better phrase, questionable. A lot of it was done by white Western men in like the 1900s. And as we know, there is a lot of bias and projection and colonial mindset that kind of comes from that area of research. But what we do know is that mushrooms have been playing a role in human beings since the dawn of human beings, like back when Homo sapiens were fighting it out evolutionarily with other members of the Homo genus. Like we have cave paintings of mushrooms from Algeria from 47,000 BCE. We have Mesoamerican carvings of mushrooms from 3000 BCE, Siberian carvings from 1 CE and beyond. Like mushrooms, humans have been into them since forever. And I am here to keep that tradition alive. I love that, Julia. This has been such a fascinating episode. And I, I hope listeners are along with us on it. Um, it. It really honestly feels like, you know, one of the things that sets human beings apart is our awareness of our own livelihood, right? Like that's how we define consciousness in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I think to have consciousness is to want to transcend consciousness. And that is just such a, a fundamental human urge. And knowing both how cool just biologically mushrooms actually are and also their uh, consistent worldwide um, and widespread use uh, in the human project of living in our body and our mind and maybe beyond it is so fascinating. Thank you for letting me info dump about my special interest, one of my special interests for a whole month, Amanda. I appreciate it. Anytime, anytime, bestie. That's that's what friendship is. Yes. Uh, and next week, we will be revisiting a story that I think our listeners know and love. But that's all I'm going to tease you with until we get there. It sounds perfect. And in the meantime, stay creepy. Stay cool. <laughs>